Thank you. So, uh, binding. You normally expect your programming language to take care of binding for you. So here in Dr. Racket is a program, a uh, simple racket program, and of course, even the environment can tell that the X argument is uh, being referenced there. Um, here's a typed racket program. You don't expect anything different there. The uh, argument can be uh, shown to be the bound uh, by the formal argument. Even the type description factorial, the programming environment can tell you that. Sorry? OK. Is that better? Yeah, we're not going to spend too much time in here. As long as you can see the arrows, that's all that matters. Um, here is a language where uh, the output is really pictures for, for showing formal semantics here. Again, I really don't expect you to read that, just the fact that the programming language that's extended to write these things that can show bindings for the meta variables. Or here's a language for writing papers on macros, and uh, you know, it knows that author info comes from the SIGBIND style. Okay. So made my point, right? You expect binding to just work. As a user of the language, now what if you're implementing these languages? There, depending on the technology you use, you may be responsible for implementing the binding. Right? These languages are implemented, roughly speaking, with macros. They're all implemented with macros in Racket, and that particular technology gives us a lot of automatic support for getting bindings right, for managing bindings automatically. So I want to explain why that's important to us. So here is a type tracket module. Let's just sort of dive down into the guts of things and look at how it's managed. So the macro needs to break up the representation of this program. Right? Those spheres correspond to fragments of the program, or syntax objects, I might call them. And uh, they're getting shipped off to the type tracket compiler. And that type tracket compiler is going to manipulate them. And these representations of the program fragment need to preserve binding structure, right? So that when type tracket looks at a declaration and a definition, that it knows they're related. Furthermore, type tracket, um, I hope you heard all about uh, gradual typing yesterday, but it's going to make sure that typed programs can interact with untyped programs, so it needs to generate some contracts to guard that interaction, which it does by using the contract language, which again is going to receive those fragments from type tracket, make up its own fragments, all of these fragments are going to be things that go to the untyped racket language. Right? Typed racket compiles to untyped. The contract stuff generates untyped racket. These fragments that it generates still refer to runtime support for typed racket and contract. They're all mashed together into this racket program, which is managed by the regular racket compiler, um, and so on. Um, so this is how the whole racket world is put together. There's a whole bunch more languages, so let's just sprinkle a few more in here. Right? And we have these syntax objects that are flying around by keeping binding information to make these languages and language extensions much easier to write. So this, we've been doing this for quite a long time, and things have worked pretty well, except as we really stress this, you can see that little sphere that escaped there uh, got fumbled by the pipes. Uh, we've, as we leaned on this model of things, um, then we've run into trouble. And what it really has to do with is our our understanding of this binding structure after all. Right? Uh, so the model that we have been using comes from a line of scheme work, and especially that the big 93 paper that describes how you shuffle these syntax objects around and keep binding information. Um, and it goes something like you have names like x, and they get introduced by a macro, so they get a color to say that they came from the macro, and then they end up in binding positions, and they get renamed uh, so that they can't conflict with any other X. And the renaming part is actually where things start to get tricky because now that renamed thing might get its own color. Uh, well, there's a very faded red there. Um, but then it might become another binding instance and so on just based on your stack of macros and macro generating macros and so on. And so you end up with these color shifting rename towers of things that manage uh, lexical binding. And it's pretty manageable for the kinds of things that the papers originally addressed. So I don't know if you can read that, but it's lambda, let, let syntax, uh, sort of lambda calculus and other local binding forms. But as we've leaned on these things, what we've introduced uh, in our extensions and our explorations of macros are things like modules and class in the Java sense and context where you have mutually recursive definitions. And this is really stressed the things that came out of the simple lambda calculus view. And then, you know, at Popple, that's a little disappointing that something that was made for the lambda calculus didn't just scale up. 
so what this talk is about is we're going to start over, try something that does accommodate modules and classes, but also can be explained in just this lambda calculus kind of world and does scale up to all the things that we need to do in Racket. So we're not going to have to look at this whole city of, of uh, flying spheres and so on. We can just go back into the regular local world inside one module and look at the problems of bindings and macros and our new representation of, of, uh, of binding for that. So. so inside a module, here's a simple definition of x. Uh, play along with me and imagine that this is defining x as some pre-computed value that we'll use many times if it's available. If it's not available, it's okay. We'll do uh, whatever we need to at each point. Right? Now, x is a terrible name, I know. It's kind of the point. I'm intentionally being uncreative with my name to simulate the collisions that are inevitable when you have this big pile of, of spheres flying everywhere. So x is a pre-made thing. And because I am so often going to say, use the pre-made value or compute something uh, more slowly, then I'm going to make a macro for myself. Uh, this is a macro called pre-made or. It just says, use the pre-made x if you can. If not, evaluate the c, which may be a little expensive, uh, but then you'll have to do it. And so I'm just using schemes or form to do that. So or x e is the expansion of the macro. And now I've got a use here. I am letting x, again, being uncreative with the name, uh, letting x be some function that'll do a bunch of work to get a value for me. And then I will either use the pre-made computation from before here, or I will have to call x. So now I have a, a, a call of my macro pre-made or. Um, it's going to expand. The macro expander is going to expand this by matches up the pattern. So E matches to X in parentheses. So when we instantiate the template, we're going to get that X in parentheses in place of E. And then the or and the X will just be literal, carried on down. And I'm painting them orange to remind us that those came from the macro expansion, which seems like a good idea. It seems like it might help us understand the difference between X in blue and X in orange. The problem is there is no X in orange binding. So how is it that we communicate, connect that x to the other x? And it's not just that the top level definitions are somehow special because my example could work if I just nested inside some program, uh, inside a function definition, say. So there's something to sort out there. And the problem gets a little bit worse if you recall that or is the classic example of a scheme macro that introduces a temporary binding. Here my temporary binding is a called, of course, x. So x is the value of uh, a, so that we evaluate a only once. Uh, if that's a true value, we return it, otherwise we return b. So we expand the or macro, and now we get this pattern of x, let's, and x is everywhere, and we've got green x's and orange x's, and there's just not enough information here to resolve the binding. And the old answer to solve this was I should have renamed some x's to y's or something along the way. Um, but I'm going to show you a simpler approach to solve this problem. And what's what really has gone wrong is that we're trying to use colors or we're trying to use just two dimensions when um, a better way to look at this is that that macro introduction lives at a different plane. Right? The let and the x's that came from that just shouldn't be mingled in a flat two-dimensional space with the other identifiers that we had anyway. And so if we can represent these different planes of existence in a better way, then uh, that will make it easier to deal with scope. So, um, Let's see what these planes of existence look like. Again, if we start with just some simple lexical scope here, looking at this, as long as you've read enough parentheses, you can immediately see the binding structure goes like this. Um, this x is bound by this let, as opposed to the top defined here, just because this x is closer. Now, another way we might draw this picture, uh, this is another conventional way of drawing the picture, is to paint the binding with the region where it binds in a particular color. And then we have these nested colors. So this X is in the pink, introduces the pink binding scope. So you could see X everywhere here, except this X is orange and covers that and then ends up shadowing it. And this Y is light blue. Okay. So you can intuitively know what this means. I want to point out that you've automatically thought about the different layers behind this. Right? You realize that even though that X was in blue, the pink layer is behind it. And if we really want to flatten this out into two dimensions, then we would just draw on each identifier the set of colors that are behind it. I've left the scope lines in place at the moment, but we can just erase those scope lines now that you're clear on where they came from. And what we have is identifiers with colors on them. Now, what I'm, the, the point of this paper is that 
we can take just this information, the set of colors on things, and have a way of saying what the binding is. So uh, the reason that this, the, the X at the end, binds, is bound by the let, is because we look at the set of colors on the reference, and it's pink, orange, blue, and then we look at the set of colors on potential binders that have the same X, you know, the same name originally. That top binding X has the color pink. Pink is a subset of pink, orange, blue, so it is a candidate binding. But the X bound by, uh, by let also has a candidate binding. It has pink and orange, which is still a subset of pink, orange, and blue. And furthermore, that pink and orange is a superset of just pink. Right? So what we used to have as a, an intuition about nesting uh, in the two-dimensional, we've just changed into an intuition about sets and supersets and, and finding the most specific subset. Right. So that is why the purple arrow there based just on reasoning about the set of colors. And we can see how this plays out if we now expand the OR macro. We have let x and if x. I painted them green, but this time it's a green behind them, right? I'm not trying to adjust the identifier itself, right? And that reflects, if I, if I did it this way, it wouldn't really work, right? If I used these solid panes behind it, because even though the pink and orange and light blue are stacked up, the green plane from the macro, it's a different plane and it's in a different dimension, and it's hard to see in this picture, right? Because we start to have to think three-dimensionally. But again, if we just flatten it out into the set of colors, the set of things, set of planes that we're supposed to be on, um, then we can reason about it again. And so here, um, I have still this pink, orange, blue X. Green is not a subset of that, and so that's why this macro introduced X here does not capture the X that was originally there. Um, actually, what's gonna happen is the macro expander is going to discover a binding form and introduce a new scope, right? That's where the pink and the orange and the light blue came together. So really, we'll be asking about uh, this color here. And what this points to is the general algorithm for macro expansion now. The expander goes from outside in. When it encounters a macro, then it adds a new scope for everything that it introduces. When it encounters a binding form, then it adds a new scope and paints everything in the region where that binding form uh, is supposed to bind. And so we've got this X, which is pink, orange, blue, and yellow. Green and yellow, which is this let binding here, is still not a subset of that. But the, uh, the one that we want it to have, pink and orange, still does bind. Even this picture is just a little bit simplified because let, the OR macro, was defined somewhere. Right? And that somewhere had a scope that I've drawn brown here. And that explains where let itself gets its binding. Right? What does it mean for the macro expander to encounter a binding form? Well, it encounters something that's bound to let. And so brown uh, would have a binding for let in the context of the OR macro. That, that part is a little bit easier to see if we go back to our original example and make sure it still works. So here I've got the pre-made OR example. Everything's in blue because everything is in the same, say, top of the module at first. The uh, macro expander finds let here. So it introduces pink for the bindings introduced by that let. So now our pre-made OR and X both have pink and blue on them. Pre-made OR, though, does refer to that macro definition because blue is a subset of blue and pink. So it will be an expansion of the pre-made OR macro. Again, we match up a pink X in parentheses with E, bring it back down in the macro expansion. OR and X, which are introduced, they get a new scope, which I've made uh, orange, like I did originally. And uh, you can see how it's all working out here. We've got um, this blue and orange, which will not be captured by this X, and so it does go up to the outside X, just as we expected. Right, and that's the same sort of thing that happens with that. So I'm kind of hoping at this point you say, wow, this is really obvious. Um, to me, it was almost too good to be true. Could you really manage macros and uh, everything we do with this? Um, if you look at modules, which is one of our motivations, then it's really straightforward. Every module is like a different scope, so you have a different color. When you import a macro from one module to another and it gets expanded, it'll introduce things that have the color of that, mac of that module. And so extract method will still refer to the blue extract method here when the macro expands. A um, more complicated case happens when you have mutually recursive definitions and that those definitions include both macros and uses of macros and definitions that come from uses of macros 
and so on. That's, that's where we're really pushing the limits. Um, and there are some, some subtleties here you can read about in the paper. But what happens is to make these mutually recursive contexts work, you need not only to paint a, a new scope for something introduced by a macro, but also have a scope for something at the use site, an extra scope for that. So I'll leave the details to that to the paper. Uh, the nice thing about this, though, even if it's some extra work um, on uh, manipulating scopes, it's just manipulating scopes. It's not like what we had to do to the old system, where we changed the data structures that, that were at the heart of the, the representation of context. Now it's just a matter of managing the scopes the right way. Okay, so the idea then is, in an implementation, a scope, which I've drawn as a color, this corresponds to some uh, opaque token. And then we have sets of these tokens. So that's a scope set or a set of scopes. And then we still have the same notion of syntax objects that we had before in Scheme and Racket, which binds, you know, bundles together a name like X along with something about its binding context, but now that something is a set of scopes. And we've scaled this up to uh, the full Racket implementation. Uh, in fact, we were able to switch from version 6.2 to version 6.3. We just pulled the old representation out from the inside, put the new one in. Okay, it's not quite as simple as that um, because it is a much simpler implementation, just dealing with these sets of things. Uh, we got the same performance out at the end, which is not trivial because I spent 18 years trying to make the other one go fast. Um, and uh, it's mostly compatible with the old one. Um, and mostly compatible means we did have to change some code. Um, any of the macros that were sort of complicated, you know, implemented complicated binding structures like class and unit, um, well, type bracket is a really big macro, uh, those had to be adjusted. But the adjustments were uh, sometimes large like class and units, usually small like type bracket. Like the type bracket implementers didn't have to do this. I was able to, uh, to work with them to make the few small changes. So overall, we changed a fair number of packages in the Racket ecosystem, uh, maybe about 5%. Those changes tended to be quite small. Um, so that means a lot of packages define macros. Some of them define complex, you know, sophisticated macros. Um, but there was, a, there was a transition path. And I consider it um, a good sign that it wasn't completely compatible. It means maybe we've moved towards a deeper truth um, to have a simpler system that still is able to do all this. Uh, I, I put all of this in the context of macros, but the problem of dealing with binding shows up in other contexts, in other program manipulation contexts. For example, everyone can read this, right? This is uh, a beta reduction, something that happens as a result of that. You have to do substitution, and for capture avoiding substitution, you're used to writing it something like this, probably, where you have to make up a new name as you push an expression under a lambda so that uh, that lambda doesn't capture some binding that you might push under it. Uh, in the set of scopes world, then you can say, you can think of it this way. Your original term that you want to substitute on has some scopes. Um, and just add a new scope to that term that you're substituting into. Now, it can't capture whatever I might put in there because uh, all the bindings have this new scope on it, and what I might put in doesn't have it. Right? And then your recursive traverser was a simpler replace anything bound by this x with that e2, and you don't have to do uh, generating new identifiers all the way down. So I think there might be something to this. In other places, we're starting to experiment with adding better support for binding management to Red X. Okay. Uh, and we'll see where that goes. Meanwhile, um, we have changed our world of uh, spheres into these identifiers with sets of scopes on them. They fly around. Everybody's pretty happy. Um, you know, when I say everyone's happy, I mean the macros that I had to convert, the new versions of them, I found it much easier to reason about. Um, we're hoping that this makes macro technology more accessible to other language communities as well. Um, uh, Tim Disney, who did hygienic macros for JavaScript, picked this up right away and has already implemented, you know, adapted the implementation to use scope sets instead of the algorithm. Um, he was very happy about how much easier it is. Uh, the Rust people are doing something similar. So, you know, macros have been a long, around a long time. Hygienic macros have not made it out into many languages, relatively speaking. And we're hoping this new, simpler way of looking at it will help other people. Meanwhile, uh, in Racket world, we're also think we can explain better to our programmers how to use macros 
um, make it easier for everyone to get on this, this um, pipeline of hygienic macros, have fresh hygienic macros uh, delivered straight to your door. Thank you very much. Uh, the connection to the scope graphs. So I'll summarize the question is, what is the connection to scope graphs by Elko Visser's group? Um, I don't know exactly. So I think we're both looking at ways of abstracting the essence of binding and make it easier for, for tools to manipulate those bindings or specify what your binding is. Um, we've been talking quite a bit. I'm a big fan of that work. So I think you should go and look at both of them if you're interested in binding. Um, they might be competitors. We might find ways of, of connecting them up. So I may have a very similar question, which is that there are multiple known ways of handling bindings. My mind just first goes to the brown indices. Um, I, know, I know there's been other work on viewing them more analogously with lambda terms. Have you done any of this theoretical thinking of comparing in some way? I don't even know how you would compare them. All these different, less classic ways of dealing with bindings. Right, so um, the reason I try to draw this connection to macros is because there's a kind of automation that you want from macros that De Bruyne indices are not gonna give you, right? Um, the, 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 the flexibility to just pass identifiers in and have the right identifiers come out. Similarly, um, I think the reason we weren't able to immediately adapt scope graphs is because they were designed originally for a more static setting not where program terms appear as you start going through your program. So I think it's that difference in macros that have led us to something more general. At the same time, I'm optimistic at the moment that that more general thing can feed back and work in, in various settings. Thank you. Hi. Um, one of the design considerations in Scopegrass was to be able to reason about the provenance of name resolution, right, rather than just Presenting the result of resolution as a as a uh, an edge from uh, a use to a declaration, we uh, have the, the full path uh, through the graph, which allows you to reason about how this uh, came about. So, can you explain how that? Do you have that kind of information in your? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And the the, the way I see that most directly is when something goes wrong, and I get an unbound identifier error. How can I trace back which part of my macro? Right. Um, this has been a step forward for us in that way because what the uh, debugger can report or what the error message can report is this identifier is unbound and by the way here are the scopes I got on this identifier and oh I see there's this identifier with the same name that has these different scopes not a subset it's bound you might like to know that and these uh, opaque tokens can often have meaningful information like what was the binding form so it's a uh, it's a little less direct uh, a little more freeform. Hmm but that prominence for debugging, it's been, uh, it's been a step forward in that way. 
Right. I mean, yeah. right. I, I should add that I mean, scope graphs are designed for static, uh, completely static analysis of, of name binding, and so we haven't figured out how to apply that to to. Uh, 